Hi, my name is Sophie McDonald, and today I'm going to be discussing my PhD project with you. So this is looking at updated chronologies for upland settlement in the Bronze Age in Scotland, and I've taken a Bayesian approach towards this, which I'm going to be describing for you. I couldn't get the keyboard shortcuts to work very well on Zoom, so this is all done as one take, so bear with me um, on this. First, I'm going to give you a bit of background to the topic. My work is focusing on the Bronze Age, generally defined as being this period between about 2250 and 800 Cal BC, so roughly between 4000 and 3000 years ago. The Bronze Age is an interesting period. The early parts often defined in the literature as being quite similar to the Neolithic, defined by large monuments, henges, cairns, um, and kind of a landscape of death and ritual, really. In the literature, the Middle Bronze Age, this point from about 1,500 Cal BC onwards, is generally seen as being um, the point when there was really a shift from this model of society to a landscape and a society that's much more defined by agriculture and settlement. So individual houses, enclosed fields, recognizable field systems. So this is sometimes characterized as a move from landscapes of the dead to landscapes of the living. Um, it's certainly seen as a move from kind of ritual to settled landscapes. This narrative is based heavily on data from Southern England um, and generally on these type sites, which are these excavations and sites that have been quite influential in the literature. For Scotland, we don't actually have very many of these. And one of the most important ones is Laird. Lairg is up in Sutherland. It was excavated in the 1990s. And what was revealed was this extensive landscape of Bronze Age roundhouses. You can see one just there uh, while it was being excavated. And the idea um, that the excavators arrived at based on a comprehensive dating program was that this roundhouse settlement began in the first half of the second millennium BC, reaching a high point around the mid second millennium BC and declining towards the end of the Bronze Age by about 800 Cal BC. Uh, it was proposed that this was perhaps linked to climate change, soil exhaustion, but essentially that's the chronology um, that was arrived at for these roundhouses. Lyrg was very well dated for its time, but techniques have now moved on. The dates that we produce are generally just more precise. We've moved from bulk to single entity sampling, which essentially means that we are better able to relate the material that we're dating to the event that we're wanting to date. And there's also this process called Bayesian modeling, which I'm gonna go on and describe for you guys. Um, and basically what this does is this all allows us to produce more precise chronologies for archaeological sites. Revisiting Lairg, because it's been such an influential site in the literature on Bronze Age upland settlement in Scotland, is an opportunity to test our older interpretations of this phenomenon, potentially shedding new light on them. I think what's important and interesting about this as well is because we've got this idea of the mid-Bronze Age as this period when you really see the origins of a more recognizable agricultural landscape. It's, it's really about understanding the origins of, yeah, this landscape that we would recognize today, really this kind of anthropogenic landscape. But there are three key techniques that underpin my work. First and most important of these is radiocarbon dating. I wasn't sure of your background, so I'm gonna really do a radiocarbon for basics here. Um, so radiocarbon dating is based on the half-life of the radioactive isotope of carbon, carbon-14. We're all part of the carbon cycle. All living things are part of the carbon cycle. And when we die, we drop out of that cycle. So we're taking up carbon from our environment, from the atmosphere while we're alive. And then we die, that process stops. By measuring the amount of carbon-14, in a given sample of material that used to be alive, and then using a process of calibration, we can translate this value for the amount of radiocarbon in a given sample to a range of calendar dates. So 
So moving on from this, Bayesian modelling. So Bayesian modelling is an approach to um, probability. I won't get into the maths here. Essentially, Bayesian modelling is based on Bayes' theorem. Um, so Bayes' theorem was developed in the 18th century by the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who you can see here. And unlike classical approaches to probability, a Bayesian approach incorporates prior information about our samples. So when I said I've been revisiting the Laird Project archive, what I've been doing is I have been looking at the paper archive and the physical archive for the site and pulling out samples basically from contacts or relating to events that I would like to get dates for. I've then been using the paper archive for the project to understand how these um, how the samples that I'm dating relate to each other um, spatially and temporally. So for archaeologists, most of our prior information that we would use for Bayesian modelling is coming from stratigraphy. So where samples are in relation to each other in the stratigraphic matrix for the site. And basically what the process of Bayesian modelling allows us to produce these much more precise chronologies. A radiocarbon date is essentially a probability distribution. And what the process of Bayesian modelling generally does using this prior information is produces a far more precise probability distribution um, for the events that we're wanting to date. The third technique um, that has been underpinning this research is pollen analysis. Peat is a really common feature of the landscape in Scotland and it's really useful when we're wanting to recreate past environments to understand what people were doing and what the landscape they were living in looked like in the past because it preserves pollen grains really well. Fossilised pollen grains are preserved fantastically in peat. And because peat is made up of plant matter, we can radiocarbon date it. What we do is we take samples from different points in our peat core. So we sample down through the peat, pull out a core. The core we had for this project was two meters in depth. And we take dates from given points in the core. We then use Bayesian modeling software to produce what's called an age depth model for this. Again, I'm not sure of your background, so I'm sorry if this is a bit basic. And by sa then sampling for pollen analysis at different points within the core, we can basically produce dated, um, dated reconstructions of the landscape at a given point in time. So because pollen from different species looks different, so a cereal pollen will look different from um, daisies, for example, and both of them indicate that different things are going on in the landscape. If you've got cereal pollen, you can start to say, well, maybe people are growing crops here. If you've got things like um, things like daisies or things like rumex, you can start to say that maybe you've got um, arable agriculture going on because that, um, sorry, pastoral agriculture going on because that tends to be an indicator of this kind of open ground that's characteristic of grazing. So yeah, analyzing pollen from different points within the core and then using this age depth model to um, basically date these points within the core means that we can recreate the environment at a given point in time, which is really useful. What we can see here is a Bayesian model or Bayesian chronological model based on what we call the legacy dates from Laird. So these are the dates that were um, produced by the original excavators, the original project. This is a site where you've got two houses basically superimposed on top of each other with a layer of agricultural activity in between. So house one here is our earlier building. It was thought that house one basically dated to the first centuries of second millennium BC. And you can see here that based on the dates for uh, dates from the original project, we've ended up with this start point, this modeled start point for house one, really in this early second millennium BC, this early to mid. And then we've got our dates from house one here. I've used the stratigraphic information basically to inform this model. So we know that house one was earlier. We know that house four is later. So house, dates from house four will come later. 
in the model here. That's basically how it works. These grayed out distributions at the back are the simple calibration and then the darker one over the top overlying that is our model distribution. Hopefully what you can see is that the model distributions just tend to be far kind of tighter ranges, they're, they're far more precise. So we basically arrived at an early second line in BC origin four house one, um, a span of probably under 200 years, but potentially under 100 years for use of the building. An interval between the two buildings under 200 years, probably under 100, and a span for the House 4 site that's really quite long, so between 0 and 240 years, um, probably between about 100, 200 years there, and the site falling into disuse that's at some point in the late second millennium BC or early first millennium BC. I've then gone on to make another model based on new dates from this site. So I should stress that this is just one of four roundhouse sites that I've been making models for at Laird. And then I've also got um, a series of other sites from across Scotland that I've been also making updated chronological models for. Hopefully what you can see here is that we're basically ending up with a much more precise chronology. We've gone from looking at a resolution at the level of centuries to decadal resolution really for our chronology, which is really interesting. So again, we've got this start point for house one, but it's looking like it's far more firmly in the mid second millennium BC than just in those first few centuries of the second millennium BC. And then quite a short use, um, the house in use for quite a short period, potentially for as little as between zero and 40 years. And then again, a short interval between the use of house one and house four. So this intervening period of agriculture is probably not particularly lengthy. And again, a short use of the house four site. And the use of the whole site um, ending really in that kind of, um, probably that mid to late second millennium Cal BC there. So generally, the prior narrative was that there was some evidence for Neolithic land use at Laird. There was some, um, some evidence for agriculture, some pits underlying the round houses, but it wasn't necessarily firm. You've then got round house settlement um, in the early second millennium BC onwards, peaking in the mid second millennium BC, and then declining in this early first millennium BC. My narrative based on um, the models that you've just seen, as well as my other models, is um, that you've got this Neolithic agriculture at Laird. From our pollen evidence, we've got really quite firm evidence for Neolithic agriculture. Roundhouse settlement, generally mid second millennium BC onwards, rather than early, and some settlement decline by about the early first millennium BC. Although, as you saw there, we've really compressed the timelines for some of these buildings at Laird, which is really interesting. But based on the evidence that I've got from other sites, you are seeing some general settlement decline, not just at, at Auckland sites, but at other sites as well, by about the early first millennium BC. Again, this is backed up by evidence from other sites. Um, so there's these ideas around whether this is associated with climate change, a move to maybe a cooler or a wetter climate, soil exhaustion caused by farming, or perhaps social change, because you do have a shift from the use of bronze as the kind of key technology to the use of iron by about the end of the Bronze Age as well. Hopefully what we can see from this is that we've, using these processes, we've been able to arrive at chronologies for activity at Laird and obviously at other sites as well, that's more precise. It allows us to arrive at more nuanced interpretations about how people are using these landscapes. We're looking at the use of buildings over generations rather than over centuries, which is really interesting. This has really been a whistle stop tour of my project. Um, I've had to do it as one take, so apologies for any filler words or any clunky bits. If you've got any questions, I'm really happy to take them. Thank you very much for your time.